I want to talk to you today about mountain moving faith. Anybody have any mountains you want to move today? Okay, maybe a few rocks at least out of the way, right? And so I'm going to look at the uh, story of the withered fig tree in Mark 11 and talk about faith. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and go to Mark 11. I've been going through the book of Mark uh, since last May. We're coming up on almost a year, so I'm almost done here with Mark, but that's a little bit more to squeeze out. Now, in this story, Jesus has entered Jerusalem the week before his crucifixion. And through a fig tree, he illustrates an important principle about believing prayer and overcoming faith. Now, faith is the connector to the kingdom. It's the key that unlocks heaven's resources. Uh, Some have called faith the currency of heaven. I I would agree. Uh, You realize now abide these three, faith, hope, and love. Love is the greatest gift. Would you agree? But it begins with faith. You've got to have faith first. Hope undergirds faith. Love abounds. But let me ask you this question. Is faith something we muster up? Do we obtain more faith by believing harder? We certainly can position ourselves for faith by reading the word, worship, staying close to the Lord, absolutely. And faith is a fruit of the Spirit, but faith is also a gift of the Spirit. And that's what I want to really focus on today. Let's take a look at Mark 11, 12 through 14, and then we'll jump into uh, verses 20 through 26. Again, this is following the day after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus sees a fig tree in the distance, and he walks towards it. Now, the next day, when they had come from Bethany, verse 12, Mark 11, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. How would you like to have Jesus curse your fruit trees? And his disciples heard it. Now, they came then to Jerusalem, and for time I won't get into this, and he goes into the temple and he drives out the money changers, and he says this in verse 17, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves? The scribes and the chief priests heard it, and they sought how they might destroy him. Now when evening come, he went out of the city. Now, verse 20, let's pick up in verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain... Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Verse 25 and 26 are part of the story. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, I'm not going to touch much on forgiveness today. It's another message. But know this, that forgiveness is important to seeing your prayers answered. You want to live in forgiveness. All right. So he comes back into Jerusalem the day after he curses this fig tree. He gets close. They all get close. They see that the fig tree has been withered. And, uh, of course, there were no figs on it. Now, it's not the season for figs. It's not the season. But Jesus, nonetheless, expects fruit on the tree. So in response to the fruitlessness of the fig tree, Jesus curses the tree. Verse 14, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. So now they're astounded. Verse 21, Peter says, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered away. Now what's happening here, there's actually two things. Jesus is giving principles on faith and prayer, and that's what I'm going to focus the message on today. 
But Jesus is also intermingling what's happened in Israel. You see, Israel and the law became unfruitful. They were to produce fruit, but they were producing no fruit. You see, right after he cursed the fig tree, he goes into the temple, and what happens? The fruitlessness is evident. They've changed the house of prayer and the house of worship into just a money exchange, a way to make profit. And so the law, hear this, the law was unfruitful, but a new covenant would produce fruit. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. Abiding in the life of Christ assures fruitfulness in every season. Do you realize as a follower of Christ in him, you bear fruit all the time? Some seasons we're more fruitful than others, but even when we don't think we're bearing fruit, we are bearing fruit for the Lord because we're in him and we're part of his new covenant. And so being in season with God, being always ready to answer anyone of the hope that we have, of the joy of Christ, of our union in Christ, it demonstrates our maturity and our capacity for greater entrusted responsibility. We have a privilege to bear fruit in the name of Jesus. Now, let's get back to this discussion of faith. Jesus responds when they are shocked at this fig tree that's been cursed and withered away and is dead. And Jesus responds by saying in verse 22, have faith in God. And he explains now the power of faith in prayer in verse 23 and 24. Jesus told his disciples, I assure you that whoever says to this mountain, and now I'm reading out of the Common English Bible, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and doesn't waver, doesn't doubt, doesn't waver, but believes that what, he said, what is said will really happen, it will happen. These are strong words. These are the words of Jesus. Therefore, I say to you, whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you will receive it, and it will be so for you. Now, know this above everything, that faith to move mountains begins with believing God hears your prayers. Knowing that God is listening to you always, knowing that God is ever present, knowing that God is the great I am, knowing that no matter what you're going through, through the good seasons of life, through the challenging seasons of life, God is always with you and God always hears. God wants to answer your prayer more than I think what we realize he wants to move. Now, what mountain is Jesus referring to? A mountain is illustrated with the fig tree or the nation of Israel. There's a dual meaning here. Uh, they couldn't see it right then, but all of a sudden, there would become a new Israel, both Jew and Gentile, when Christ offered that sacrifice on the cross, and then he's resurrected from the dead, ascended on high, and the Holy Spirit is poured out. The church now moves into the new Israel of God, and Paul talks about that. This is powerful. In other words, that mountain moved. But he's also talking about the mountains we face, those impossible situations, the hindrances, the difficulties. And so Jesus demonstrates that faith provides an entry point for God to move amid impossible situations. But how can this be? Whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you will receive and it will be so for you. How can this be? I don't know about you, but I've not seen all my prayers answered. Does my experience nullify the word of God? Does your experience nullify the word of God? Is it possible there's an element of prayer and faith that we're missing? I believe there is. These are the words of Jesus. I think we've limited him too frequently. All right, so how do we obtain faith in God? How do we obtain real faith in God that moves mountains and we see prayers answered? And I hope to answer that through the rest of this message. Now, remember the story back in Mark 9. I love this. Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration with the, the three, you know, Peter, James, and John. I mean, all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah appear to them. What a church service, right? I mean, Peter's like, we'll just stay right here. We'll erect some tents, and, you know, we'll just, just do something right here. And the Lord's like, no, no. And they come down off the mountain. They come into the valley, and there the other disciples have been with the man. 
and his son is demonized, and the disciples are unable to cast the demon out of their son, unable to heal the son of his epileptic-type seizures, which are caused by a demon. And so uh, the, the man asks Jesus, you know, he sees him coming off the mountain, and he says, Lord, if, if you can do anything, right? And Jesus says in Mark 9, 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Again, did the man just have to try to believe harder? Did he just have to muster up his faith? Well, maybe if I read my Bible for an extra half hour a day. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Here is the answer to that question. Jesus is not speaking of intellectual belief or agreement, but a heart belief that is real faith. Everybody say real faith. It's one thing to know concepts in the mind. It's one thing to even know Bible principles or know passages of Scripture and have them in your mind and memorize, and that's good. I believe strongly in memorization and reading of the Word. It's another thing to have that Word come alive in your heart, where your heart believes that Word. Now, Jesus, only Jesus, can give this type of faith. It's to the heart, not the mind. You see, belief is an assurance of the mind. Faith is an assurance of the heart. Amen. Uh, you can believe all kinds of promises about physical healing, just have it mentally, but really in your heart it's not come alive yet, and you don't realize or see the healing take place in your life. Pastor, you're saying we need to have more faith? I'm saying you need to have Jesus' faith. You see, when I pray for someone or anyone's praying for the sick or whatever, it's my faith, their faith, but then there's Jesus' faith. My faith may come short sometimes in your situation. Your faith may come short sometimes in your situation. But Jesus' faith, when we are faithless, he is faithful. His faith never ebbs, never diminishes, never goes out. He is relentless, as we sang today. He pursues us with his love. He pursues us with his grace. When Jesus gave the word to Peter, remember the story, Mark 14, 28 through 31? They're in the, in the boat. They're at night, storm on the water again. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus cruising on the water. And Peter, like so many of his, Lord, if it's really you, I'm not sure, Jesus, if you're in the midst of this, but if it's you, bid me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. I like friends on the water. Come. But that word come, it empowers Peter to act in faith. Before Peter had that word, all he had was a belief and I'm wondering, if that's Jesus, maybe I can step out. But when the word came, come, all of a sudden it imparts something. Faith is a seed. Faith is a grace gift. Faith now explodes in Peter's heart, and he knows what's impossible now is probable, and he steps out of the boat. Oh, yeah, I know. He looked at the waves, and, and he began to see the situation, and all of a sudden he begins to sink. Okay? But for a moment, Peter had the faith of God. He had Jesus' faith because he stood on what, Je on what Jesus said, come. And he grabbed a hold of it and he began to walk. Peter could have acted before the word, but that's belief, not faith. Many make the mistake of confusing their many, mental ability to believe with the imparted faith of Jesus. It's one thing to want to believe so hard you see that answer. It's another thing to have a peace and a knowing and an assurance. God's given me that gift of faith. I know it's going to happen. I remember when we were in the season, Carolyn and I, we were getting ready to buy this church property. We didn't know about this church property at the time. And God began to speak to us to begin to look for a building. The church was about two years old, and, and uh, we'd been meeting in a hotel facility, and 
did some meetings for, for nine months on a vacant lot on Sunday mornings and things. And so we had this stirring, and the Lord began to make it very clear that there was a building, there was a property for us. And, and we began to look at all types of different property around the city. You know, s- storefronts, uh, empty shopping malls, uh, different buildings, you know, business buildings, church property, all types of things. I, none of it, I want you to hear this, did I have a peace with. I, I had an impression and a word from the Lord to begin to look for a piece of property. But the faith for all of those other buildings was not there until this one came along. Oh, not this, by the way, not this building. This building wasn't built. That came later. That's another story. That took a lot of faith. <laughs> but the original church, by the old brick buildings over there, and this used to be where this building is, was a parking lot. It wasn't until this building appeared, the Lord showed us, and we looked, then all of a sudden, then he spoke, come, Bob and Carol, and come, Passion Church. At that time, we were known as Tucson Area Christian Fellowship. Come. And once we had the word come, all of a sudden, poof, in the heart, faith explodes. You see, sometimes we're trying to have faith for a situation, and he's not said come yet. I'll tell more about the building in a few minutes. When God's faith is released in your heart, all of a sudden, your problem becomes smaller and the assurance of the answered prayer is discovered. You see, faith is as much about discovery as it is about believing. Faith is as much about knowing the heart of God and being so close to Jesus that you know what he's communicating. Your prayers for the situation take on new boldness and confidence with God's faith. I like this quote that Reinhard Bonnke, how many are familiar with Reinhard Bonnke, the German evangelist? He's done great work in Africa and literally millions to Christ. He said this about mountain moving faith. He says, I don't want to play with marbles when God told me to move mountains. But if we want to move mountains, we need to hear what Jesus is saying. In 1991, we were living in Florida, newly married, and we had some debt and things. And uh, we'd attend, attended a financial class at our church. And, and uh, I remember the facilitator of the meeting uh, sharing with us, it was a Saturday morning, and sharing, you know, put, put goals down. You know, what, what are your goals, right? How many of you have t- attended some type of financial right, class? You, you know what I'm talking about. Put goals down. And so, it, of course, you know, I'm giving you the very brief version of what was going on that Saturday morning in that seminar. And, uh, but, you know, all of a sudden the Lord spoke to me, and I wrote it on a piece of paper. He said, you're going to be debt-free by October 1st, 1992. Uh, how many like to go to that financial seminar? It's the financial seminar of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, okay? I didn't muster it up. I wasn't trying to believe for it. Now, in my heart's desire was to see some of that debt removed and us to come into a better place. Uh, But I was just in a place where my spirit heard, not emotionally, not uh, some type of... You know, it was a very calm seminar. It wasn't Pentecostal in any respect, okay? Very calm. And God gave me that word. I wrote it on a piece of paper, a little notebook piece of paper, debt-free, October 1st, 1992. Boom, put it in my Bible. And just began to pray on it. And just waited on God. Carol and I had uh, uh, this small business that we had started right after we were married. And uh, I continued to work as an engineer, and she left her engineering job, and she ran this business that we started, you know, full-time, and, and uh, all of a sudden, we then began to get a word from God in 1992, in the summer of 1992, so now months have gone by, about selling this business, and different things began to happen, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, the Lord brought a buyer, and this small little franchise that we bought and that we ran, all of a sudden, the buyer is offering us twice as much as what we had paid for the franchise, and we ran for less than two years, and he's going to buy it. And so the interesting thing, and I didn't put all of it together until all of a sudden it just happened. 
And one thing led to another. There was a couple of delays. We were supposed to close on September 30th, 1992. And because of another delay, we closed on October 1st, 1992. The money that we got from that paid off all the debts that we had except for our home mortgage. All the short term debt. It literally exactly like what the Lord had put on our heart. And the Lord used, and now we did not become like, you know, millionaires in any sense. And we had a few thousand dollars after we paid some debt. But the Lord used that money as seedbed for, the, for, our, for our greatest heart's desire, and that was to do missions work and ministry work for him. He began to use that then so we could serve him in a greater way. A book that you can, by the way, I think you can download this book for free if you search it on Amazon. It's called, uh, or I'm not Amazon, on Google. I get my big companies mixed up here. Uh, the Real Faith for Healing by Dr. Charles Price. He's long passed on now. Uh, the Real Faith for Healing. It is one of the best balanced books on faith and healing. How many of you have read that, that book? Some of you, yeah. And uh, isn't, that a, isn't it a rich, a wonderful, rich, rich book? The Real Faith for Healing, Dr. Charles Price. I actually have an old paperback copy. That thing is falling apart. I love it. He says this, Dr. Price, now just to tell you a little bit more about him, he was an attorney that got touched by the Holy Spirit right after the Azusa Street Revival. I believe it was actually an Amy Semple McPherson meeting. Uh, she was the founder, evangelist, that was the founder of the Four Square denomination. I, I think it was like 1921. He was powerfully touched and began to, to listen, be able to hear the voice of God, moving the gifts of the Spirit. Healing and miracles were noted in his meetings. If you read his book, though, his approach to healing is so balanced, full of faith. But he said, listen, it's not healthy to say, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. And all you have is belief and not the assurance by the Spirit because Jesus has deposited something in your heart. Very, very balanced. And remember, at that time, there were many in the modern-day Pentecostal movement, faith healing movement that really began in the late 1800s, that had become imbalanced. Some were recommending not seeing doctors, not taking medication, etc. And people were dying. Some, some ministers were being sued because people dying because they took an imbalanced faith approach, okay? And so that's, he's one of the older Pentecostal leaders that saw such amazing miracles, people coming out of wheelchairs and everything, and yet his faith is very balanced. Uh, he tells one story in the book of ministering to one person. I, I forget if it's a, I believe it was a woman, and he just knew that God had deposited faith in her heart. He had faith that she was going to be healed that night. Sure enough, she was dramatically healed, came out of the wheelchair. Someone was in the meeting that was also in a wheelchair. They weren't healed. And they were there the following night, and they told uh, Dr. Price, tonight's my night. I'm going to be healed. And he writes, and he says, I knew they weren't going to be healed that night because I could discern that Jesus had deposited the faith in their heart. They didn't have the assurance. They were just going by belief, what they wanted and what they saw happen the night before. The person wasn't healed that night. He tells of other stories of how is God, he, he told another brother one time, uh, listen, he got prayer in the meeting. He knew this brother did not have the faith to be healed uh, that night in the meeting. And he said, listen, you need to just wait on the Lord until he deposits in your heart that gift of faith. And you know as you know, you have a peace that Jesus is going to heal you. And it was some time later he saw the brother in another meeting, and he could tell from the moment he saw him, he could see the peace of Jesus on him. He, there was no striving anymore. There was just the gentle assurance that only Jesus can give. And that night the man was gloriously and miraculously healed. There's something to this. I, I, ever since I first read the book years ago, I come back to it every now and then and was revisiting it this week as I was preparing this message. There, there, there's just gems in there that just, uh, this thing. I, I had lunch with a pastor Wednesday before I left Thursday to come back here to Tucson. Uh, pastor Joe, that's all you need to know. Uh, uh, pastor in Maryland, he's almost 70. Powerful man of God wonderful church that he leads. And Joe, I'm sitting there having lunch with him. I've never had anybody with stage four cancer tell me that they had stage four cancer with such peace and calmness in his life. 
I'm sitting there having soup and a sandwich, a couple other pastor friends were just sitting there and, you know, just talking. And, and uh, I said, Joe, well, how, how are you doing? He goes, I'm doing well. He goes, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And he just went, oh, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm just like, he is so peaceful and so calm. He is trusting Jesus, unlike few people I've ever met. He's a word of faith preacher, by the way. He believes in the power of faith, word, but he wasn't hyper-spiritual with this either. He, he, wasn't, he didn't once tell me, you know, you know I'm going to be healed. I'm gonna, no, he was calm. He, he was just trusting Jesus. Someone needs to hear this today. Sometimes we're trying to muster something up instead of letting Jesus deposit something in our heart. Hebrews 12, 2. Jesus is the author and perfecter of your faith. What does the writer say? Looking unto Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the alpha, the omega. He's the beginning and the end, right? If you want more faith, you've got to look to Jesus. Now, here's the interesting thing. I'm not going to do a whole study right now on uh, the book of Hebrews, but know this, the writer of Hebrews, in mentioning, you know, Hebrews 11, all of the Old Testament heroes of faith, he's giving us something more than a pattern to follow. I I've always looked at that Hebrews 11 as these great men and women of God of faith, and, and we want to pattern our lives after them, and certainly there's some things we can learn and, and we should pattern our lives after but actually, the purpose of what the writer of Hebrews is doing is giving us a new starting point in Jesus and the new covenant. Let that settle in for a minute. In other words, their faith that you read about in Hebrews 11 actually points to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, right? We're to lay aside every weight and the sin, he goes on to say, that, that can easily slow us down and beset us. He goes, we want to run the race. We have a new race to run and only can run in Jesus. So this Old Testament cloud of witnesses point to the new race in Christ. We are to run. We are to look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. All true faith begins and ends with him, this alpha and Omega, when I want more faith, I must seek Jesus. Uh, you must seek Jesus when you want more faith. Read the word, stand on, pro but get it beyond your mind into your heart. You see, you can have God's faith as you learn to keep your focus upon Christ. The moment you take your eyes off Jesus, you lose sight of the primary goal of your faith. He is the goal. He's our destination and the reason we do what we do. Faith to move mountains begins and ends with Jesus. He's the source of our life, our greatest joy, and the motivation to ask audacious requests of the Father. Real faith is rooted in the nature and character of God. As you learn to trust Jesus more, his faith will be imparted to you. The genuine faith of God is to know Jesus well enough to know what he wants to do in any situation. That's true faith. That's real faith. Sometimes Dr. Price talked about in his book, I forget the exact episode, but he was ministering over people one night in a prayer line, and he came to one lady, and the Spirit whispered to him, tonight's not her night for physical healing. She needs a healing of the heart, and until she's able to forgive, she's not going to receive her healing. Now, that may throw some of you in your theology, but you see, Jesus was after something different. Dr. Price prayed for her, but encouraged her, you need to go home and you need to forgive those that have hurt you and those that you have holding offense onto. And it was after she did that, then she got prayer for the physical condition, and then she was healed. Sometimes, and there's a whole other message we can talk about hindrances to healing, but if we want to see the greater faith in our life, we have to walk in a place where our eyes are so on the Lord, we're not holding on to petty offense and unforgiveness and these things that happen to us in life. It happens to all of us. But we need to walk in that. But when we're praying for people, we also need to realize that Jesus may be after and doing something that's deeper than what the physical need or the present situation is representing. Sometimes, by the way, there could be a severe financial situation a couple or a family is going through, but the Lord's trying to get at their marriage and he's trying to go something much deeper. 
Could God get them paid off in debt in six months or a year? Absolutely. In fact, he could do it on Monday morning, send the Brinks truck. <laughs> but he's more after that marriage and healing the wounds that are there than maybe, right? It, 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 Jesus sees it. Remember, he's outside of time. He's eternal. It's though C.S. Lewis said it, so God looks at the, at the page of a book, and every now and then time, there's a sentence on there, and he just steps into time. God can step in at any moment into our situation. The question is, what's going on in our situation that he's trying to heal? He's after something much deeper in our lives than many of us realize. Hebrews 11.1 1, in the Amplified. Now faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of the reality. Faith comprehends this fact but cannot be experienced by the physical sentence. Again, I submit to you, this type of faith only comes as Jesus deposits it in your heart. You can position yourself through worship, prayer, reading of the word, you know, church attendance, you know, being involved in the community of the believers, all of these things. But it's not until the Lord releases that in your heart that you're going to have that assurance. True faith is an expectant anticipation of the reality of the promise before the manifestation. Faith acts upon God's revealed truth with an assurance of the answer. Again, you have the faith of God when you hear Jesus say, come. When you hear Jesus say, come, then you know. Back to when we bought this building. We'd been looking for months, the different buildings, like I said, didn't have a peace with any of it. And that morning that Carol and I came with the realtor to look at this little church property, that was for sale by the Wesleyan Church. That morning, as we walked through there, God began to speak to me. And he said, I want you to write an offer on this. You know, make, a, make an offer of intent on this property. I didn't even have a chance to talk to Carolyn or, or whatever, and I just blurted out to the realtor as we get done, we're going to write a letter of intent on this property. And Carolyn looks at me like, <laughs> I don't recommend that, husbands, by the way, but I just... But we weren't buying a house. I was buying God's house, okay? So I'm still on kind of dicey ground here, right? Uh, and so the next, that afternoon, I, I said, you know, let's, let's contact the, those that were the leaders of the church at that time. And I said, I said, let's have a, a, you know, I talked to the realtor. Can we have a meeting? I'd get the leaders here Saturday morning. It was a Friday we first looked at the property. I said, I'd like the other leaders to see it and just see what the Lord's speaking to them. So I got up Saturday morning, and I, I really began to pray, and I said this. I said, Lord, I got a pretty strong impression from you yesterday that we're supposed to buy this property, but I really need a word from you. I really need to know that you're saying, come, walk on the water here, okay? And so the Lord speaks. He, he goes, Bob, he goes, he goes this, is the, this building, this is the building blocks and the stepping stones to the church and revival, the equipping center that I've spoke to you about. Don't look at the size of the sanctuary because that little, little sanctuary is really small. He goes, don't look at the size of the sanctuary. Don't look at the money in the bank. We had $2,000 in the church account. The property was valued at $510,000. Two-year-old churches with 30 people and $2,000 don't buy buildings in the natural. And so he gave me that word. And when he did that, I had a gift of faith. It exploded in my heart. And uh, uh, so when I came into the meeting... It was all I could do to be patient, to let everybody share their thoughts. And most of the people, and I say this kindly, spoke out of their natural reasoning. Well, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? Listen, when you need to move mountains, you don't need natural reasoning. You need to hear what God is saying, okay? And so I gave everybody an opportunity, and then finally I said, okay, this is what God has said. <laughs> and I had such faith I knew it was a done deal. And later, Carolyn, uh, the Lord gave Carolyn a word of, uh, you know, a same kind of gift of faith. She was washing dishes, and the Lord, and she said, Lord, I, I need the same kind of faith. He gave her that faith, and she knew it was done. We had the title deed. Before we ever physically had the deed to this property in our hearts, we knew it was done. I want you to see this. Whatever situation you're facing, uh, God gave David the same kind of, uh, one of our leaders gave the same kind of, he said, listen, you don't have the faith, but you can trust Bob's faith, is what he actually spoke to. And so it, 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 it happened, 
but we still had work to do. We still had to work together. We still had to raise funds. I still had to approach banks about loans, etc. You know, could God have sent the rich oil man from Texas, you know, with, you know, five? Yes, he could have, but he didn't. He wanted to do something with us where we joined our faith and we walked in unity together, right? Sometimes God's not going to do He's not going to do the supernatural because he's expecting us to work together as a team in the greater place of unity for his greater purposes. So we mix our faith because he sees something down the road maybe we don't see yet. So God did it. And, you know, and, and whether it, it, that was the build, but I had the same kind of title deed experience praying for people. I remember one time I got a word of knowledge uh, in a meeting uh, for a man. Uh, it was a gallbladder. I just got a, a word of knowledge gallbladder. Okay, by the way, anybody with gallbladder problems here today? If you got, just raise your hand. If you've got a gallbladder problem, I want you to receive this word, okay? Get, yeah, I want to pray for you. So I got a word of knowledge, gallbladder, and it was like, for me, I, kn- I, I get a gift of faith for healing when I sense the Lord's presence really strongly, especially I get a burning in my hand. Now, listen, if you don't ever have that type of sensation, pray for the sick. It doesn't work the same for everybody. Dr. Price talked about in his book, he would, would have a, a gift of faith. He would knew God was going to heal when he'd get this impression on his shoulders, this fiery presence on his shoulders. He knew when that happened, God was about to heal in the meeting. Okay, So I, I, my hand is burning. It's tingly. I get this word of knowledge, gallbladder. And so a, a man in the room comes up. He turned out to be the bus driver for our team. He came up and began to pray for him. As soon as I started praying for him, he goes, Oh! And my hand was on fire. I'm like, this man's going to be healed. I knew it. Sure enough, a couple minutes of, ugh. He goes like this. I go, how are you doing? He goes, well, the pain's gone. But I'll know tonight when I eat. I said, all right. Well, it turns out he came with us to have a, a dinner afterwards. He goes, he came up to me. He's, he's eating this pizza with like pepperoni and sausage on it, all this stuff, you know. And he's, he's going, look, I'm eating this pizza. He goes, no, my God, everything's fine. I go, come on, Jesus, you know? So you have the faith of God when you hear Jesus say, come. What's he saying? Faith is substance of the nature. Faith sees the promise fulfilled while positioned in hope. Faith makes a demand on the promises of heaven. Faith perceives as fact what is not revealed to the natural senses. Faith takes hold of things, God's promises, his revealed will, that the senses cannot perceive and views them as a real fact. Faith makes invisible realities available on earth. Faith realizes that answers are in motion before the mountains start to move. I heard heard another story this week. This one's really wild. One of the most audacious, bold prayer uh, statements of faith I've heard. Uh, I actually have, I think, a minister colleague. His name is Dr. Jerry Savelle. He's in Texas. How many of you are familiar with his ministry? There's only one letter that separates our names, right? Anyways, uh, Jerry is a really well-known word of faith preacher, and and, uh, I don't claim to be, but I I believe in faith, you know. But uh, God began putting on his heart years ago, and by the way, I'm not Please do not pass judgment on him about an airplane. But the story is amazing, okay? Sometimes in the church we we make judgments about people and their ministries and what they buy, purchase, what they use, etc. So that's not my heart in doing that. But I I thought the story was so bold I want to tell it. So another minister friend of mine was telling me the story this week where Jerry Savella told him how uh, God began to stir in his heart years ago about getting an aircraft for, for his ministry traveling. He's got Bible schools around the world, different things. And so God told him, he said, listen, you know, your word, whatever we pray and ask for and we believe that we receive, we have. And God spoke to him and said, you're believing for the airplane, but where's the hangar you're going to put the airplane in? He says, you're right. So he goes down to the Dallas-Fort Worth airport and he tries to rent a hangar for this airplane that he's just still waiting to manifest, Okay. It's in the unseen spiritual realm. It's not in the natural realm, right? So, so he has a hard time with the man. 
the man says, we cannot rent you a hangar. First of all, there's no hangar space. And even if we had hangar space, you don't have an aircraft. We cannot rent you a hangar if you don't have a, an aircraft. And so <laughs> Dr. Savell tells the, man, the young man, you, are you a Christian? He says, yes, I am. He says, you don't want to have to answer to Jesus for not renting me that hangar. I don't, now that's manipulation. I don't recommend that either, okay? But the story, I mean, it's funny. The man, some, he comes up with a hangar. He signs, he rents the hangar. Three months later, he has the aircraft. There's aspects of faith. You know, God likes a bold, audacious faith. But be careful you don't fall into presumption. Don't go make the mistake today. You go down to the car dealer and you're going to buy a brand new car and all that kind of stuff. You know, well, I just listened to the pastor, a message of faith, and I'm believing. <laughs> Get a word from Jesus before you make major decisions, right? In closing, Jesus is the author and perfecter of your faith, Hebrews 12, 2. You can have God's faith as you learn to keep your focus upon Christ. Your faith is strengthened as you follow Jesus and understand who you are in him. If you want the faith to move mountains, learn how to hear, believe, and act upon what Jesus reveals. Real faith, true faith, the faith of God comes from him as you hear him. Real faith is rooted in the nature and character of God. Real faith isn't pretentious, arrogant, bold, right? I, I, I mean proud. It, it'll be bold, but you don't want to fall into pride, okay? Okay. Now, that said, sometimes when we're standing in a bold determination of faith that God's given us a word, it may appear as pride to others. It just may be a bold confidence because God's given us that word, okay? And so, but we want to make sure it's in the nature and character of God. As we learn to trust Jesus more, his faith will be imparted to you. Again, faith is to know Jesus well enough to know what he wants to do in any situation, the same Holy Spirit who rose Jesus from the dead lives and abides in you as a follower of Christ. The, this is the truth of why Paul could say in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. That resurrection life of Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit is in us. And as we hear from him, we can make bold declarations and see mountains move. Now, real faith starts with surrender to Jesus. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to the Lord or you've been in that place, you've been kind of wandering and maybe you've wandered from the Lord, I want to encourage you, just surrender it all to him today. Give your life completely to him. Can we go ahead and get some worship music on? I want to move into a little bit of music here, uh, ministry Can I, down, down, can I, uh, the, uh, the gallbladder, Carrie, can one, your son, okay, you just found out last week, so we'll pray for him in a minute, so we'll pray for the gallbladder in a minute, now, can you turn the music down quite a bit, just very softly, here we go, uh, th this morning I was getting a couple of words, but they're not directly words for physical healing, although one is in a minute, I'll give it. The Lord wants to heal marriages. I, I've so strongly, God has released a fresh anointing on this house for the healing of marriages. There's been a lot of pastoral counseling that's been taking place, practical things, but there's something supernatural. Those of you that are struggling in any way, whether you've been getting any counseling of late or not in marriages, I just want you just to receive this word right now. There is something supernatural that the Lord is doing. He's moving. And I felt like the Lord said, every marriage, this season, right now, for this, this is a now word for this church, this season, every marriage that is struggling, Lord wants to heal right now. And so right between you and the Lord, you don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to come forward. If you want some more prayer when the altar team comes up in a little bit, you can. But if it's just you and the Lord... Just take that word right now. Lord Jesus, give and ask him, Lord, give me the faith for the healing of my marriage. Stop trying to change your spouse. 
Lord, I receive the gift of faith for the healing of my marriage. Lord, start in my heart. Heal my heart, my brokenness, my hurt, my wounds. Just receive it right now. Lord, I just release your healing grace. Every marriage, every marriage that's struggling, those present, those not present, those that are associated with this church, I declare healed in Jesus' name. Every marriage. Lord, every place where connection has been lost and intimacy has been lost, I declare healed and restored in Jesus' name. Restored, healed, renewed, made whole in Jesus' name. I also felt like the Lord, in the same vein, every broken relationship, this applies single, whatever, married, families, children, church friends, co-workers, whatever it is, God wants to heal and mend hearts. There is something coming to the body of Christ that's more glorious than we've ever realized. And he, start, he wanted to really minister to the heart issues. Lord, I pray right now, every broken heart, every broken relationship, I pray that you would mend and you would heal right now. And if you don't have the faith for it, ask Jesus right now between you and him. Lord, I need faith for the healing and the restoration in this relationship. And believe that he wants to give it to you. He'll show, just listen to what he says and be obedient and follow. You may need to ask for some forgiveness. You may need to try to make some restoration. The Lord is going to do something. Lord, heal relationships. I pray for a healing in the body of Christ in this hour. In Jesus' name. Now, uh, this is a physical word of knowledge. Uh, fibromyalgia, I felt strongly this thing of fibromyalgia, and I felt like the Lord said, for many that are struggling with, not, it's not every case, but I believe many, fibromyalgia, which is pain, uh, doctors, they diagnose the pain, but they don't know what the cause of it, the root is. I believe the Lord told me today, for many, it is trauma. Yeah. Something has happened in their life Maybe they're still holding on to bitterness. They may just be holding on to the trauma, the wounds of what happened to them in the past. The Lord is wanting to heal that pain in your body and the trauma. Let the Lord get to the root of the trauma and the wounds that are there. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking right now, the trauma, if you've got pain in your body related to fibromyalgia, just I want you to receive this word right now. If you're watching online or here, Lord, I just, just give him permission. I give you permission, Lord, to heal the trauma and the wounds in my heart. You may need to forgive those that have caused the trauma. Sometimes sexual abuse, sometimes domestic violence, sometimes just hard situations we go through. Uh, sometimes PTSD, uh, literally from you know, war veterans, but PTSD can be caused by other situations as well. And so, Lord, I pray any traumatic situation, sometimes we have trauma. Uh, it's occurred to us early in life when our, we're, we haven't really fully, the people that should help us ad- bring us into identity, sometimes they're the very ones that cause us trauma. Does that make sense? And so uh, other types of trauma or events that happen, to, but sometimes it's formative years that trauma occurs because we don't get what we should have gotten. And so, Lord, I'm asking, go deep right now. And so you may not, I, I, I'm just releasing something in the spirit where the Lord is going to begin to work in your lives, those that are dealing with trauma, certainly fibromyalgia, those kind of conditions, to get to the root issues. And so, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just go and touch those root issues. And I just feel led to challenge some of you. This week, with my dear friend Steve and Sally coming, listen, the the faith level in this place is going to get amped up for healing. You need to be contending this week for the healing of those marriages, the broken hearts, the relationships, any trauma that's going on. Just fast, pray, seek the face of God, and believe for something to take place in your life this week. Counseling only goes so far, but when Jesus comes and touches that issue. And so, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing right now. So, uh, can I have the altar team? Give me, if you want some more prayer for any of these things that I've talked about or other physical conditions, come on up. I want to pray for the, the gallbladder 
Go ahead and you bring, him, bring him up, Mike and Carrie, and we'll pray for that. You guys doing all right? Yeah. Jesus, impart your faith today. Uh, carpal tu- Who's got the carpal tunnel? That's a word I get frequently. Severe pain in the wrist. All right. <laughs> Anybody else carpal tunnel? Just come on up. You guys doing all right today? You're just processing everything that... Can I have some of the altar team? Altar team, begin to move. Help me. Can this sister over here, somebody begin to pray? This brother? Carpal tunnel. Anybody here that you do have the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, is that anybody present with that? Just come on up. I want to get you to get prayer, prayer as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you, you want to share? Hey, Kelly, you want to share that? This is Car- Kelly just shared something with me, I think. Just share that real quick. Really. Hi. Um, so a while back when Joanne Moody was here, um, I had a dramatic healing in my back. Uh, this was a problem that has gone in my back for about 20 years. I had been prayed for more times than I could count, and I was at the place where I didn't even want to ask for it anymore. Um, The key was trauma, but it was my self-forgiveness, really, is what that was around. That was the key to that being healed. So if you have had something happen and you hold any kind of self-unforgiveness or even toward the Lord. Self-hate, any type of self-hate. Loathing, anything like that. uh, That is from the enemy. That is not from God. It's not true, and you need to forgive yourself. Forgive God, and that might be the key for you too. I pray it is. Thank you, Thanks. Lord. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Jesus.